experimental study you are about to see is one of 18 similar studies during which we compared various methods of artificial respiration. We simulated field conditions first by selecting as subjects men and women of various body types who weighed between 110 and 210 pounds. Second, by anesthetizing and curarizing these subjects in order to simulate limp asphyxia victims. Third, by having untrained lay personnel perform some of these methods. And fourth, by not using an endotracheal tube. To help orient you, we have made a diagram of the experimental setup. Here the volunteer, the victim, a rescuer, an anesthesia machine for inflation of the victim's lungs with oxygen before and after performance of ineffective methods of artificial respiration. Here an ear oximeter which indicates relative arterial oxygen saturation, a carbon dioxide analyzer, a blood pressure cuff, an intravenous infusion set for the administration of drugs. We used one or the other of the following two instruments for measuring tidal volumes of respiration. A pneumograph, volumetrically calibrated during performance of the mouth-to-mouth -mouth methods. Now the subject is being rendered unconscious by the intravenous injection of one milligram of scopolamine and by several doses of meperidine. After 20 minutes he will have received 300 milligrams of meperidine and will no longer respond to verbal stimuli. Now he is unconscious. Watch the breathing bag and the position of the head. With the head extended, chin up, the bag is moving freely. With the neck flexed, chin down, the pharynx is obstructed, the bag does not move. Now succinylcholine, a curare-like agent, is given by continuous intravenous strip. All muscles, including the respiratory muscles, will remain paralyzed for the next three hours. The subject is paralyzed and apneic. Intermittent positive pressure breathing is performed by manual compression of the breathing bag. Now the head is extended and you see good chest motion and excursions of the pneumograph. Now the chin is dropped and no exchange. Again, extension of the head, good exchange. The mask fit is checked for leaks by compression of the breathing bag. No gas escapes, therefore we may connect to the spirometer. First we study the chest pressure method with the subject in the supine position. There is no artificial airway in place. Note the position of the head. It is not held in extension. The spirometer tracing in the corner shows zero exchange. Try to follow the ink writer indicated by the arrow in the corner. Watch closely when the chin is pulled up, a tidal volume of 180 milliliters will follow. chin up. Now, subsequent tidal volumes, however, diminish in size and finally again zero exchange because the chin dropped. The next method we are going to study is the chest pressure arm lift method, also called the Sylvester method. The rescuer is performing 12 cycles per minute. The subject's head is placed in extension and an artificial oropharyngeal airway is in place which prevents obstruction by the lips and teeth and also holds the tongue forward. With these optimal airway conditions you can see that the spirometer indicates tidal volumes of 280 to 340 milliliters. Unfortunately in two of our nine subjects studied with this chin up position plus an airway, all tidal volumes were smaller than the estimated dead space air. Now we will study the currently taught back pressure arm lift method, also called Holger-Nielsen method.
the subject is turned into the prone position. The face mask, which we are using, is a special flat mask. A conventional anesthesia mask would protrude and interfere with the natural position of the head when the subject is lying prone. Now the rescue is performing the back pressure arm lift method as it was taught since 1951. Namely, the subject's head is turned to the side and his hands are placed under his cheek. An artificial oropharyngeal airway is in place which prevents obstruction by the lips and teeth and holds the tongue forward. The spirometer shows that all tidal volumes are smaller than 50 milliliters. This means no air reaches the alveoli. Notice how each arm lift maneuver pulls the subject's body towards his head, thus increasing the flexion and torsion of the neck. This is an enlarged copy of the spirometer tracing which you have just seen. All tracings you will see are read from the right to the left. Note that there is almost zero exchange and air is squeezed out of the lungs. Now you will see the most effective mouth-to-mouth -mouth method for use in adults. We call it the thumb-jaw lift method. Note the hand positions. The right hand pinches the nostrils. The thumb of the left hand is inserted between the teeth. The mandible is grasped at the midline with the left hand and pulled forcefully upward. The pneumograph shows tidal volumes of 2,000 milliliters and more. Now comes the alternate method, or two hands jaw lift method. Both hands grasp the angles of the mandible and pull forcefully upward. The thumbs retract the lower lip to prevent obstruction by the lips. Air leakage through the nostrils is prevented by the rescuer's right cheek. This method we recommend for use in victims in whom the thumb cannot be inserted because the mouth is tightly closed. It also is the method of choice for infants in whose small mouths the rescuer's thumb would occupy too much space. This S-shaped breathing tube, also called mouth-to-mouth -mouth airway, made mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing more aesthetic and more effective. The large airway for use in adults and children. The small airway for use in children and infants. The end which remains outside is the mouthpiece for the rescuer. First the airway is inserted. One hand forces the mouth open. The other hand inserts the airway over the tongue, taking care not to push the tongue back into the pharynx. The rescuer prevents air leakage through the nose and the corners of the mouth. Either this way, or this way. We studied the performance of portable resuscitation equipment in the hands of untrained rescuers. They performed on paralyzed volunteers. We used a bag mask unit with a source of oxygen. A bellows and a mechanical resuscitator. During the first 60 seconds, less ventilation than with mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing, or no ventilation was produced with some of this equipment. This was due to difficulty in maintaining a patent airway and a tight mask fit, and due to a delay in getting the equipment set up. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing, therefore, should be started immediately when the victim is found while waiting for equipment. Oxygen resuscitation equipment should be used when it arrives, if the rescuer knows how to use it and knows how to maintain a patent airway and a tight mask fit. This boy scout will perform mouth-to-airway breathing. He weighs 100 pounds. He has some difficulty but corrects himself. He was able to adequately ventilate subjects weighing up to 210 pounds.
This is a firefighter performing mouth to airway breathing. 87 untrained rescuers performed mouth to airway breathing. All produced breaths larger than 500 milliliters within 60 seconds after one demonstration. All could insert the airway within 40 seconds. We therefore conclude that the problem of upper airway obstruction in the unconscious person deserves more attention. Positive pressure breathing may overcome partial obstruction. When the person is found apneic, immediate reoxygenation is needed. One should not wait until resuscitation equipment arrives. Back pressure arm lift and chest pressure arm lift methods of artificial respiration proved unreliable. With mouth to mouth breathing, reoxygenation can be accomplished within seconds by deep inflations through an open airway.